it for reading God's word for us. We all have uh, different criteria for leadership. And uh, if you notice in the recent years, one of the key criteria in this generation for leadership is eloquence. Never mind whether they are liars, whether they have integrity or not, as long as they are eloquent. People love such leaders. I don't know whether how many of you have watched the recent debate between Trump and Biden. And the, key, the news focused very much on Biden's stammering and it was reported as an awful performance. Don't get me wrong, I'm not for one or the other. I'm not in the American politics. No. But you see, the focus is how well they speak. And sad to say, such men that mentality is not only found in politics, whether it's overseas politics or local. It is very sad to say that it, such mentality also permeates into the church when we look for leaders. We love and we are easily swayed by eloquent speakers. Do not get me wrong again, eloquence in itself is not a sin and it's not evil in itself. But in today's passage, we showed us that there's more important criteria than eloquence. So we'll take a look at the passage today, but before we do that, let's pray, shall we? We thank you, Lord, for your word given to us in Deuteronomy 18. We pray for wisdom, Lord, as we open up your word in Deuteronomy 18. You grant us eyes to see the truth. You grant us the hearts to receive your truth. May your Holy Spirit work in us and through us as you speak to each one of us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I put the first uh, portion, the first segment, verse 1 to 8, cat for to cat. The passage began with a command to take care of the Levite priests. And the background to this is that the whole tribe of Levites you know, the, out of 12 tribes of them, they have no land. So you, I, I, I show you a picture like this. You see the land there. Then you see all the tri tribes are there. One, some tribes are divided into two. You know, but no Levites. The Levites are not given a single piece of land. Why? Well, the Levites are supposed to serve full time as priests the whole of their life until they retire. You know, and then we ask ourselves, what is the job scope of this uh, Levites as priests. Well, take a look at verse 5 and verse 7. It says there twice, it says they stand before the Lord to serve. At the time was tabernacle, but when they get into the land, it will be soon when they build the temple, it will be the temple itself. You know, so they are supposed to administer sacrifices and offerings. So I put here the job scope of a priest is a mediator standing before God on behalf of the Israelites. So it's a mediatory role. And what do they do? They have to offer sacrifices, offer offerings, prayers, and serve in the temple through all these. You know, and they represent sinful Israelites and to go before God to make atonement for them. And each one of them come with the weight of the sins, the guilt of, uh, of their... Uh, their, their sinful behaviors and all, and they present their sacrifices, and the priests will offer these sacrifices on their behalf, and then pray for them. So on their shoulder bears a heavy load of the guilt and the sin of the Israelites. So I put here, in, they are people who are who are supposed to have the heart that lovingly cares for the people of God. This is a, this is what a, a priest is supposed to do. It is like in our modern day example, people who, who cares for others are easily taken, uh, taken for granted. For example, the mother job at home, caring for the family. You know, when you wake up, the coffee is there, breakfast is ready. Someone woke up earlier to do all this. You know, when you come home, dinner is there, you just dump your dirty clothes. Somehow, within two days, it's washed and ironed. You know, and you, sometimes we don't even, we don't even uh, remember, we actually skip our notice. The cups, the plates, the bowls disappear after a meal. They're washed. The toilet hairs on the sink or the stain 
the mold automatically disappear. And sometimes we just go in and out of the toilet, we didn't, dis uh, didn't notice any of these things. You know, so the person who take care of us a lot, like the mother at home, normally gets uh, forgotten and they are taken for granted. It's like a priest, you know, a priest who actually cares for them a lot, a real leader with a heart for people. And sometimes they are forgotten. That's why over here, verse uh, 1 to verse 8, it, how, that's how it began in verse 1. And that's how it ends in verse 8. They are, the Israelites were commanded to care for the priests because the priests cared for them. So I put here, they, 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 they being cared for to care for the priests. You know, and verse, verse 1 tells you they must have enough to eat. Verse 8 says they must have enough to eat. You know, so how? How to make sure that these priests are provided and they have enough to eat they and their family? Well, the rest of the verses between 1 to 8 will tell us that the, the, the rest of 11 tribes who were given land and when they receive the produce of the land, they are supposed to share it with the priests. Whether it's from farming, agriculture, or from the grapes, when the wine, or leaves, plants, where the oil is, uh, meats from the sheep, and the wool as well, you know, to make clothes. You know, so the Levites have none of these things, but they are supposed to be kept for they and their family so that they will not starve. And they can focus on the full-time uh, work in the temple and in the offerings and in prayer. And in fact, this was actually neglected. In the later times, in, if you read the first and second kings, you realize that there are some situation happens when the Levites actually were not taken care of and the Levites actually left the work of the temple and they work in the field to provide for themselves and their family. You know, that was, next time when we preach First and Second Kings, we'll come to that. You know, so, for now, we pause between verse 1 to verse 8 and say, what are some implications that we can look for? Number one, if you are looking for a leader, look for someone who is people-centered, like the Levites, a heart for God's people. You know, not merely eloquent people, you know, and, but leaders those who have a genuine care for God's people. They will take time for people. They will talk to people. They will talk to people. They will get to know people personally. They will care for them and constantly point them to Jesus. You know, these are leaders that we should really look up for. Second implication, care for these leaders. You know, and because they always constantly look after us, they care for us, and we, it's very easy to neglect them. So what we can do, if you have IDG leaders, if you have your uh, people who minister to you, who read the Bible with you, uh, write a card to them, buy them coffee maybe, you know, and uh, give them words of encouragement. Pray for them, because leaders need to be kept for too. Lastly, it is more direct way, support these full-time gospel workers. You know, it's one of the direct uh, application here. We have uh, recently one full-time uh, gospel worker who just joined us uh, on board in our, uh, as a staff team in, as Clo in Clo uh, uh, Chloe. And we are actually looking for one more possibility that will join us in our Chinese fellowship. You know, and I didn't plan the sermon, nor the timing of coming of Chloe. I didn't plan any of this. I, I told you that beginning of the year, I didn't even plan for the budget for this. I didn't know who will come in. You know, and I just planned the sermon series. I didn't know the timing is so soon. When all the past few passages in Deuteronomy preached by Si Tong, by uh, Nari, all talk about giving, and Chloe come in as a full-time person. And now I'm talking about this, and we are looking for a CF, uh, 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 possible CF pastors. You know, so the God's providence, the timing, the event fall in place, and all, all these things. So I'm not that clever. God engineered all this. You know, so it happens that I'm, I'm preaching this today. You know, so let's move on. The second part of this passage, heard to hear. And it began with a very serious warning. You know, and at the first glance of this passage, it seems that it's quite disjointed. disjointed. It jumps into some warning against practices of witchcraft, spiritism, warning against consultation of mediums and diviners. And, and, but when we look at this passage carefully, we see some repetition in this passage and we begin to see well, that there's some theme that's running through here. I'd like to suggest to you that, that repetition is this word called listen. You know, verse 14, it says, These nations 
these pagan nations listen to these fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the people of God, the Lord forbids you to listen, to do this, to listen to these things. You know, so they are not supposed to listen to all these diviners. Verse 15, the Lord himself says this, the Lord has raised up for you a prophet like me from among you, and it is him, this prophet, that you should listen to. In verse 19, it says, whoever will not listen to my words through these prophets, as he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So it seems that this word listening is a key theme that runs through the second part of this passage. And, and it is really asking, what kind of leaders should we listen to? The surrounding nations, the pagan nations, listens to people who seemingly know the future and their faith. You know, they, they listen to people who have some kind of connection to God's spirits or the dead. And listen to some gurus, experts, who seem to have some kind of power or authority. But God's people must not listen to this, all these things. It is said here, they must listen to the prophet that God has sent. So we ask ourselves, what is the job scope of this prophet? Verse 18 says this. That it says, God put his word in this prophet. He will speak all that God had commanded. So, I put here the prophet is actually a mediator representing God to men. You know, a priest represents men and come to God. But a prophet represents God and come to men. You can see it's, it's a kind of like opposite way. Yeah, and what are they supposed to do? They are supposed to give God's word and only God's word to God's people. They are supposed to be faithful, I put here, and bold. So, uh, faithful and bold to give God's word to God's people. Why? Because if you take a look at verse 16, it says, when God spoke to them directly in Mount Sinai, they were so scared. They know if God continues to do that, they will die. God says, well, what they say is correct. They will die. So God heard them and says, what they said is, is right. So God heard them and gave them a mediator so that they will hear God speaking to them. That's why I put the subtitle here, heard to hear. God heard them. They are so afraid when God speaks directly to them, you know, and they will die. But then there comes the warning, verse 20, it says, well, what these prophets are not supposed to do is to be presumptuous, give their own words to people. Now, well, these are the, probably you will see in the past, uh, our modern Christianity today, in the past 30 years, this is a very uh, common trend. People like to hear directly from God. You know, and they want to, they, they will claim that God speaks to them directly in dreams, visions, some kind of impression of a small, still small voice, or even phenomenal like the wind and the clouds and the lightning. You know, so people like to hear that race. When in verse 16, when people say, if God speaks to us directly, we will die. But today, say, people are like, yeah, God speaking to me directly. You know, so there's a warning here. What is the warning about? not to be presumptuous and carelessly equate these experiences as God's voice, as God's authoritative voice. No matter how sincere we are, how sincere they are, we must understand we can be very sincere thinking that God speaks to us, but we can be sincerely wrong. We may have the same question as the Israelites says, how do we know? How do we know God has not spoken to these people? But verse 21, that's the question for verse 21. He says, how do we know these are the people who have spoken presumptuously? Well, the answer is this. The things that they predicted did not come true. Whatever they say, it, wouldn't have, it, it doesn't happen. You know, so, years ago, before Pastor Vincent came to our church, we have some pastors, one pastor particularly, who go around telling us about his dreams and his visions. And, all, and even among the EDC, he will share his his vision from God. You know, some, he saw some vision or dream from God. And lo and behold, it didn't happen. You know, so we know yeah, it's not. So one of the things that we are look out for, that people who claim to have some kind of experiences like this, is claiming this. I put here, 
they seem to have some kind of authority or power suggesting that there are some kind of closeness that they are to God and you are not. I'm so close to God that God speaks to me directly in the dreams or vision. And because I have that, I have some kind of power over you and your life. You know? So it is dangerous to uh, listen to such experiences and simplistically equate it to God's authoritative voice. Where can we find God's authoritative voice? I put here, verse 18, it says, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded. Well, the authority, the final authority of God is found in his word. The final authority of God is found in his word. So there are two implications I put here. Firstly, do not be gullible, easily bluffed by any authority, any authoritative voices or experiences. And always check back to the Word of God, see what the Word of God says. You know, the authority they may claim could be people who have some, people who are experts or gurus in a financial field, political realm, in expert in psychology, philosophy in some fields, human management, and bring it into the church, or even some scholarly, biblical scholarship. You know, so do not be gullible to be bluffed by them. Second, if you want to look for leaders, what kind of leaders should you look for? Well, seek leaders who place their highest and their ultimate authority not in traditions, well, we are Presbyterian traditions or whatever Reformed traditions, not in traditions you know, or not in our practices of the church, neither in their own preferences, but they place the highest authority in the Word of God. And I put that these are biblical, principled, centered leaders. Allow me to sum up what, what I'm talking about here, including recap, uh, do a recap for last week's sermon a true Christian leadership. What is a true Christian leadership? Well, last week, we talked about the king. And I put here, king is a purpose-centered leader. He's a mediator who rules or governs God's people on God's behalf. That's why he's a mediator. As a mediator king, he does not perform his personal or seek his personal purposes. You know, so hence, last week's passage says he will not pursue, he should not pursue possessions like gold and silver, power, like increased number of horses, war horses, or pleasure, has many wives. So not seeking his own personal purposes of power, possessions, power, or pleasure. Rather, he's supposed to immerse himself in the word of God so that he knows the heartbeat of God. And he can rule God's people for God's purpose, kingdom purpose. This is what a true leader is supposed to be. That's what is last week's sermon. For today, let me sum it up. There are two other leaders we talked about, which is a priest. It is a people-centered centered leader. You know, he cares for God's people and stands as mediator between men and God. And he cares for God's people who are laden by sin effects of sin in this world. This is the kind of leaders that we should be looking out for. The third kind of leader, which is the prophet. It is a principle-centered leader, and this principle is based on the authoritative word of God alone. Not tradition, not gurus who are experts in this area or that field, no. Neither putting himself up as some kind of mystical authority or power. This is truly a Christian leader, a purpose-centered leader, a people-centered leader, a principle-centered leader. And this is the kind of leader that we need today as parents, as church leaders, as any of our leader management roles in the world. This is the kind of leader that we need, that we lead, need them towards God's kingdom purpose and not for ourselves, for power, possessions, or pleasure. And we need them to genuinely care for the people that we need, 
and not to use people. Lastly, we need we use God's principle, this biblical principle of love and justice and not manipulation. You know, this is the kind of leader that we need to be. But sad to say, if you and me are we are honest, you and me fail as such leaders, as parents, as leaders of our own field. And we, the church also failed to produce such leaders. But thanks be to God, the true leader that we ought to follow and fulfill all these criteria is Pastor Vincent. No, 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 it's, it's not Pastor yeah. Definitely it's not me. He's far away from me. I'm worse than that. No, the true leader that we ought to follow is our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the true purpose-centered king. Colossians 1.13 says, God, the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. He is that king. And he comes to do God's kingdom purpose, which is to bring us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Through the redemption that we may, in the kingdom of, di- in the kingdom of light, we may receive redemption, being purchased, and also receive the forgiveness of sin. This is what the kingdom purpose is all about. And this is the king that we need. Not just that, he is also that people-centered priest. Hebrews 10, he says, that, and by that we have been, we have been sanctified, set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. So Jesus is that priest, but he didn't offer animals. He offered up his own body as sex sacrifice. And not just that, the same verse that Siton pointed out in Hebrews 7, he says, consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lived to make intercession for them. So he made that offering, sacrifice of his own body, but after he rose again from the dead, he continues to pray for the believers. You know, he offered up intercessions, he offered up his body and he offered up intercessions for us. He is the ultimate priest who cares for us and who loves us and gave his body for us. Lastly, he's the ultimate prophet. I quote from Hebrews again. He says, How shall we escape if we neglect such great salvation? It was declared, it declared or spoken at first by the Lord. So the Lord spoke his word of salvation to us. And it was confirmed or attested to us by the apostles or those who record the rest of the New Testament for us. So he is that true prophet who gives us the word of God or the word of life of our salvation. So some implication for us to think about from here. Do you place your ultimate and your highest confidence in any human leader? Please do not do that. Because at one point or another, human leaders will fail us. When the news a few years ago, the news of Rabbi Zechariah's scandal appeared, some, pe- some believers' faith are shaken. Why? Because they place their faith in a human leader. When Tim Keller died, some believers were frightened. What would be the future of the church? Why? Because they place their confidence in human pastors. So do not place your ultimate and highest confidence in any human leaders. Your father, your bosses, your leader in church. Well, at one point or another, we must understand we are all human and we will fail. Not even politicians or anyone. So where should we place our faith here? I put here, well, place our faith in the person who is the true king, the true prophet, and the true priest. The place of faith in Jesus alone. How does he save us? Take a look at it. As a king, Jesus will save and lead our rebellious will to serve God. So that's what the king, he will save our will who are so rebellious to turn it around and continue to lead us to serve God. And as the priest, he will save and lead our hardened heart that can only love ourselves, but now by his death on the cross, he melts this hardened heart so that we can love God again 
and love the people around us. That's what, as a priest, he does it for us. Lastly, as the prophets, he will save and lead our worldly minds who trust in all the human theory, all the human uh, mind and wisdom. He, he will turn this worldly mind by giving us the word of God so that he will save our mind to think the thoughts of God. He will save our whole person, our will, our hearts, and our mind. He will save us as a full person. The question is, have you done so? Have you put your faith, entire faith, a right type of faith in this Jesus? If not, you can do it now. You can say a simple prayer like this and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for placing my confidence in human leaders, parents, bosses, good friends, you know, or even in myself. And I believe that you are the true leader. You save and lead me as a king, as a priest, and a prophet. You save my will, you save my heart, and you save my mind. Help me to follow you for the rest of my life. And you pray, and the Lord will listen to you and will grant you the necessary faith to put in Him. The third implication, the last implication, this is a title of my sermon here, Led to Lead. What does it mean that I put here? Unless and only when we ourselves are led by the Lord Jesus, the true leader, then can we be true leaders. A Christ-like leader that God placed us as parents, as church leaders, as bosses or superior in your workplace, or anywhere, or in your school, uh, anywhere. You can only be a true leader if you are first led by Christ Jesus, the true leader himself. So there are two things to think about. Number one is, if you are not willing to be led by the Lord Jesus, you must understand you are never a true follower of Jesus. Even you claim that, yeah, yeah I believe in Jesus, I, I'm led by him, I, 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 but it's definitely not the Jesus of the Bible. It's a Jesus of your own imagination. So unless you are really led by this true Christ Jesus, the leader, the prophet, the priest, and the king, then you are never his true follower. Second, and if you are not willing to be led by any leaders that God has placed in your life, whether it's your parents, whether it's authority in school, at workplace, the governing bodies in our country, or church leaders, if you are, you are never willing to be led, you are not ready to lead. If you do, you'll make a very bad leader. A reflection for us to think about. Who are you following all this while in your life? Who are you following? Some people are following certain, certain founder of a denomination. Some people are following some authority, charismatic elders and pastors. Some people are following some influential leaders or bosses or organizations. It is said that they are never actually following the Lord Jesus himself. So who are you following all this while in your life? Are, are you following the true leader, the Lord Jesus that God had provided? I give us some time to think, to pray, and I'll close in prayer. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the true leader. You, we pray that God, those who are not following you yet, 
that you'll be so gracious to lead them to yourself and help them to understand that God, you have laid down your life for them to purchase them and to offer to them the forgiveness of sin that they may recognize following you as a true leader is the best thing in their life. Thank you for hearing us and help us as believers to also to continue to follow you as the true leader, humbly, willingly to follow you as our King. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.